I will talk about the transcriptional activation of a non-coding DNA region. You know that most of the genome is non-coding. 95% is non-coding, but it is transcribed. Some of it we know what is transcribing, small RNA, microRNA, ribosomal RNA, but, but most of the non-coding DNA is a mystery. And actually, most of the non-coding DNA has not even been sequenced. It's not true that all the genome has been sequenced. There are millions and millions of base pairs that have not been sequenced, particularly the so-called satellite DNA. Satellite DNA is DNA consisting of re tandem repeats of very short uh, sequences. And there are many kinds of satellite DNA, satellite one, two, three, alpha satellite. And so what I'm going to talk about is the activation of a satellite DNA transcription that is usually silent. And uh, the activation by a stress treatment, and in this case, we use heat shock. Okay, but before going into the, so, uh, let me introduce the players. Okay, this is a cartoon that you know very well, represents the processing of coding RNA. So, well, there's nothing to do with, with the non-coding DNA, but yet. I, I introduce the players, you know, that as the transcript emerges from chromatin, it is covered by a lot of protein, particularly two classes of protein which you have heard about, HNRMP proteins and SR proteins, SR splicing factors. So the splicing occurs, the, the mature mRNA, which is still covered with HNRMP, moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Some of the proteins are discharged and go back to the nucleus and eventually is translated. The proteins, the two family of proteins, which are HNRNP proteins, and I want to point your attention to this minor component, H up. The major one, HNRNP A1, A2, you have heard about in, in uh, Tito Barale talk, uh, very important, but this one was the hook that allowed us to discover the phenomenon I'll be talking about. It's a minor HNRMP. We are looking for the function of this HNRMP. And the HNRMP proteins have a modular structure. They have RNA binding domains and auxiliary domains, which are usually glycine rich or something like that. The other class of protein is SR proteins, which are splicing regulators, splicing factors, and also they have a modular structure, <coughs> RNA binding domains, one or two, and auxiliary domain consisting of serine, arginine, dinucleotide repeats. You remember this? I talked extensively about this one, SF2 ASF. Okay. Why, why we, we were looking for a function of this tiny minor, minor HNRMP, and we decided to perturb the phenomenon. When you want to find, look for a function of something, you say, well, let's disturb it and see what happens. And we applied the heat shock treatment. Heat shock treatment is a stress treatment consisting of exposing cells to high temperature 42 degrees for an hour, or 45 degrees for five minutes, otherwise they die, and then bring them back to 37 degrees. Usually, they survive this treatment, but what happens during this treatment is that the transcription and DNA replication, which is not represented here, is shut off. Transcription and splicing, everything is shut off except for a few genes. You know, the heat shock induces the activation of a transcription factor, heat shock factor one, which is normally in the cytoplasm. And when you apply heat shock, this transcription factor trimerizes 
and goes back to the nucleus, where it binds to the promoter of the heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins, 70 heat shock proteins, which are the only proteins that are produced, very few proteins are produced during heat shock, and they are chaperonins. They are produced to protect the, the other proteins from destruction. So when you remove the stress, you bring back the temperature to, to, to physiological temperature, the transcription resumes, the normal splicing resumes, but people have observed that if you look at alternative splicing, there is perturbation. In other words, if you look at the various isoform of, of an antigen, uh, during this period, the ratio between the different isoforms is not the, the one that you normally have. <clears throat> OK. Let, you know that what, all these things happen in the nucleus. In the nucleus, the nucleus is like a factory. You know, there are a lot of compartments, shelves where things are stored, and, and there are lots of bodies, okay? <clears throat> and you know about them, you know, most of them are very popular, are also on textbook. For example, speckles, I don't know where they are. Beside the nucleolus, there are many other bodies speckles where, where the splicing factors are, are concentrated, are recruited, coiled bodies where SNRP RNA goes back and forth, and so on. What we discovered during this work is that during heat shock, a new organelle, which is not represented here, we don't find it in textbook, is transiently it appears, not during the heat shock, but during the recovery period. And, and this organelle that appears transiently was discovered by <coughs> staining, this is an immunofluorescent staining, with this HNRMP protein, we didn't know what it was doing. So if you immunostain the cell at 37 with an antibody against this protein, you see that you have sort of uniform staining with some concentration. But after one hour at 42 plus three hours of recovery, all the protein is recruited to six, for example, in this case six, but there will be two, four huge bodies. And these are huge, you know, they are one to two micron in size. And so we call them stress bodies. And the stress bodies have been officially recognized by transient organelles. And, and the, there, is a, there was a review on, uh, in science by David Spector where you can see here, here, nuclear stress bodies are listed as the bona fide nuclear compartment. So these nuclear test bodies, as I said, what is the properties? They appear in heat shock cells three hours, the top is three hours after recovery at 37. The phenomenon is reversible. You don't require protein synthesis. It does not occur at four degrees, so it means that it requires energy. So in the cold, it doesn't happen. It requires RNA synthesis. And, well, this is a detail that is not. For many years, skeptical people say, well, what you are doing, you are denaturing proteins with heat and denatured denature protein aggregate. It took a long time to convince people that this was not the case. And you will see that this is not the case because not only heat produces this phenomenon, but also other type of stress, like heavy metal treatment, cadmium sulfate, hyperosmotic shock. You grow the cell in a high concentration of sorbitol, whatever. 
So different kinds of stress produce the same thing. So it's not a denaturation of protein. What, what, what is in this huge thing? There are several things, but not everything. For example, most HNRNPs are not in there. In particular, HNRNPA1, which is the most abundant, is not there. Many, so they are novel nuclear structures. For example, they do not co-localize with coil bodies. You have staining against HAP, the, the, the HNRNP, and against coiling, coiling in red. And when you merge, you don't see the yellow spot, which indicates co-localization. They do not co-localize with the splicing factor SC35 and SR proteins. What are they? We look at the electron microscope, and turns out that these huge bodies are aggregate clusters of perichromatin granules. Perichromatin granules, the, the electron microscopies know what they are. They are the very compact form of ribonucleoprot. So it's a transcript, probably blocked in the processing, cover the protein and become a tidy little sphere. Many of these little spheres, they converge. They usually are found at the heterochromatin border of the compartment. They converge and they form this huge stuff. And what causes this is the heat shock factor one. Heat shock factor one comes into the nucleus, binds to whatever, to wherever it binds. We'll see what, where it binds. And it co-localizes with the stress bodies. So HAP and heat shock factor one they are in the same place in this huge chunk of, but only a subset of splicing factor are there. For example, SF2, ASF, SF2 is clearly there, see? The yellow color, SRP35, 9G8 is there, but SC35 is not there. So in these huge bodies, we find some HNRNP proteins, several splicing factors, some 68, you remember some 68 from my first talk, the splicing regulator, very important protein, is in the body. Transcription factor, HSF1, HSF2, and the RNA polymerase, plenty of RNA polymerase. Now, Cell, well, if you, you expect that if this body sequester some splicing factors and not other, some splicing factor and not HNRNP, you expect, you know that, for example, HNRNPA1 and SF2 have an opposite effect on splicing. So if you have two alternative five prime splice site, depending on the abundance, the relative abundance of HNRMP A1 and SF2, uh, you choose the proximal or the distal splice factor. So you expect that when you form the stress bodies that sequester, for example, SF2, but not HNRMP A1, you change the splicing pattern. And that's what happens. Very simply, if you look, for example, at the, you know, the uh, adenovirus antigen E1A has different isoforms of splicing. And we look at three of them <coughs> during the recovery from splicing, and you see that the relative abundance of of the three isoforms changes during, probably due to the fact that you have altered the distribution of splicing factors in the HNRMP. 
Okay. Problem is, what are these? Why do they form? Where do they form? We knew, we observed, and other people observed that the number of these bodies was correlated with the ploidy of the cells. You know, ILA cells don't have 44 chromosomes, 46 chromosomes like, but they can have the double chromosome here and there. So the number could be 2, 4, 6, 8. So there was something correlated with the ploidy. The other thing that we observed, that you could repeat this, the treatment. So heat, cool, heat again, and every time the, the body formed in the same place of the nucleus. So we, we concluded that was, was, there was a, some locus, some chromosomal locus where the, the, that was a center of crystallization of this body. Okay? And this is true. And what happens is that you know, we used, uh, you know, you can do which chromosome supports this phenomenon, we ask. What we did, oh, this phenomenon happens only in human and primates. Doesn't happen in rodents, <coughs> mouse or hamster. So we used hybrid cells that contain hamster chromosomes, where can you introduce one human chromosome at a time and ask which one of the chromosome causes, supports this phenomenon. Turns out that there are three chromosomes, 15, 12 is not shown here. But most important, in, in our lab, a guy, a cytologist, had, was working with the mini chromosome that you know, is propagated in the cell, in the, in the cell culture. And this mini chromosome is this one. It's a tiny chromosome. It's a piece of chromosome 9 overlapping the centromere. OK, if you take this and you put it into the hybrid uh, uh, hamster cell, it, it produces the, the, the body. What is in this chromosome? In these chromosomes, and this simply shows that the pericentric hetero, is, is heterochromatin, almost all heterochromatin. Okay? In particular, satellite tree sequences, heterochromatic. And this slide shows that, in fact, the two bodies, and this is the, the mini chromosome, you see they go there and there. While if you look at chromosome X, nothing happens. You, know, you have the bodies and and the sequence recognized by the oligo, and they do not colocalize. So what happens? What happens is that when you heat shock uh, cells, the satellite tree sequences, which are, as I said, millions of base pairs, normally in a heterochromatic status, so very transcriptionally inactive, they become transcriptionally activated. And you can see here, use a probe against satellite 3, and I'll show you the secret satellite 3. It's very simple. It's a repeat. And you have an enormous increase of, uh, of RNA, polyadenylated RNA. The increase is, where is the? is 100,000 fold. It's very asymmetric. Only one strand is transcribed. And it is transcribed. So how comes it is transcribed? It shouldn't be transcribed because the, the heterochromatin constitutive is rich in repetitive element, it's transcriptionally silent, doesn't contain acetylated histones, it contains methylated histones, 
and is, is associated with this protein, which is a marker of heterochromatin. While <coughs> euchromatin is transcribed and is characterized by acetylated histone and so on. So what happens? This next slide shows that stress bodies are not associated with heterochromatin. Okay? With histones <coughs> that are methylated <coughs> on lysine 9, for example, which is typical of heterochromatin. Instead, they contain acetylated histone H4, which is typical of euchromatin, so of, of the of active chromatin. And this immunofluorescence showed that. And again, are associated with histones acetylated on <coughs> arginine 8 and arginine 16. And uh, which is again markers of open chromatin, euchromatin, transcribed chromatin. So in summary, here is what happens. You have this enormous increase of satellite 3 transcription, asymmetric, okay? One strand is transcribed and produces a GC-rich RNA. The other strand is transcribed much less, 10 times instead of 50,000 50, times increase. And this shows that, uh, again, the satellite 3 RNA co-localizes with the stress bodies. <coughs> and you see it with the reverse oligo and not with the direct oligo because it's asymmetric. So here is the model of what happens in our opinion. You start with heterochromatin pericentromeric DNA. So it's, it's tightly packed, nucleosomes, okay? It's composed of satellite three repeats. If, when you hit shock, the HS1, HSF1 is recruited to this region because satellite three repeats, for some reason, contains a, a, a recognition sequence for HSF1 which is repeated mil thousands of times. So a lot of HSF1 goes there. HSF1 is known to recruit the histone acetylase. And so this factor changes the heterochromatin into opens, loosens the, the, the chromatin structure. And RNA pole 2 jumps in and binds to thousands of, of, of sites and starts transcribing from many different sites. You have RNA pole 2, and as the RNA that is produced emerges, it's covered immediately <coughs> with RNA binding protein. <coughs> then, since this is not a normal a regular RNA processing pathway, the, this RNA is packed into tight granules which coalesce to create what we see at the microscope as the stress body. And then, eventually, after hours of recovery, the, the whole thing disassembles And the, the euchromatin becomes again heterochromatin. The RNA disappears, is degraded, and I'll show you what happens exactly. So this is the, our model of what happens in heat shock. So the satellite, so we cloned these transcripts very easy. 
we have a lot of them. <coughs> it's, uh, this is the repeat. So we have 100,000 times repeat of this sequence, terminated usually by, by this other sequence. This slide shows that satellite tree uh, <coughs> you degrade. If you degrade satellite tree <coughs> using antisense satellite tree RNA, you lose the binding of this uh, up SF2, but you don't lose the binding of each of factor one. Why? Because these two guys are bound to the RNA, while each shock factor one is bound to the DNA. Okay, so it stays there. As I said to you before, not only each shock factor one induces this phenomenon, but also many other stress treatments. For example, <coughs> heavy metal treatment, calcium, uh, sorry. Cadmium sulfate causes the same thing with different kinetics, but that's not very important. Um, UVC, hyperosmotic shock, while other, diff other treatment in our hands, hypoxia, time within starvation, differentiation, they don't seem to, to cause the same thing. The interesting case is the hyperosmotic shock. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. So I go quickly. OK. Hyperosmotic stress <coughs> elicits, you see, the, the stress body. Interestingly, in this case, HSF1, each of factor 1, is not involved. There is another factor that behaves like show factor one with response to the osmotic variations. And it's called tonicity element, tonicity element binding protein. So it binds. There is this, it's a transcription factor that finds its target in the satellite tree repeat. And it causes transcription activation, exactly like HSF1. And maybe there are other cases. Okay. In fact, this tonicity element by the body co-localizes during osmotic stress. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is that what happens to this satellite tree RNA? We know that it stays in the nucleus. It is not exported. The experiment with heterocarion and so is there, is there. Eventually it disappears, but it takes a long time to disappear. Okay, you see the level, you find some of it after 72 hours from the shock. Four days after the shock. You can still see them. And say, well, that's, we imagine that, but, it, but it's degraded. So we, we hoped it would be a situation like the one that you certainly know in Pombe, where the uh, heterochromatin is reconstituted starting from this region, you know, repeated elements. Uh, you have to transcribe this region. And then through the RNA interference pathway, you produce short heterogeneous RNA through Dicer and, and Argo and so on, or thing that you know. And, and this heterogeneous RNA hybridizes back to the, the region that is open and recruit the factors that close the chromatin and reconstitute heterochromatin. And you know, many things that happen in Saccharomyces pombe uh, happens also in uh, mammalian cells. And so we imagine that the same thing could be happening with 
in each shock cells on satellite tree. Um, and so we looked for the presence of short heterogeneous RNA, which, you know, they should be 23 nucleotides long and so on, they have their features. Unfortunately, this is not the case. What we see during the recovery is a short, a ladder of short <coughs> molecules, satellite tree molecules. The ladder, the interval, are five nucleotides, exactly the length of the repeat. So it's degraded at every step you know, of the repeat. Of course, the, the short sequence RNA, uh, are RNA sensitive. They are RNA. They derive from the satellite region of the human chromosome 9, which is the one that I showed you. The production of salt does not depend on dicer. This was the big disappointment. So they are not the, the short heterogeneous RNA like in Pombe. So we inactivated dicer with siRNA against dicer. No way. It's not affected by ALGO2 inactivation. And we don't know. We don't know what pathway of degradation of RNA is operating. Lynn McQuatt, which is not here, suggested that it could be a, a, a pathway called RAT1 that operates in the nucleus. Because we checked also the exosome, nothing. All we have. Does it go from the 5 prime or the 10 prime? You know? We don't know. I may be wrong. And so that's where we stand with the uh, <coughs> faith of this. OK, this is another story I'm not going to talk about. The other thing that is coming out recently is that the presence of this bulk of huge structure Inter I'm finished. Interferes with the separation of chromosome and mitosis. And this is the next field of research that we refer in the next years, if I'm still around. <coughs> so stress is no good. Okay, <laughs> it causes problem during mitosis in the segregation of chromosomes, chromosome break, uh, uh, aneuploidy. We know that. And these are the people who did the work, especially. I didn't do anything since five years ago. Beppe Biamonti and other people, these are the collaborators. Thank you.